I think the presentation you're going to hear today from our district attorney is incredibly timely and incredibly important. And without further ado, Mr. Mark Bennett. Well, good morning. Or afternoon, excuse me. <laughs> so I'll send, I'll give uh, send regrets from Sheriff Easter. Um, among the issues right now in the criminal justice system is staffing, and he had a, um, as important as, as his constituents are, uh, having employees run the jail and, and do the work is also equally important, and so he had a meeting in, involving staffing issues he had to go to, so he'll come and, and uh, maybe speak on this same topic at some point soon to give you some added perspective. But um, so we're going to talk a little bit about fentanyl and some other issues, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have about both the specific issue of fentanyl, but also just criminal justice issues that are undergoing or ongoing right now in our, in our system. Um, but let me talk to you, let me put this in a little bit of perspective. Um, methamphetamine is still king in this area in terms of the driver of crime, in terms of the number of drug-related crimes, drug-related uh, homicides, uh, robberies, all that sort of thing. Methamphetamine is still the biggest scourge that we're dealing with. The, the thing that's unique about fentanyl, which should concern all of us, is the uh, lethality of it. Um, people are dying from it at a rate that, is, that far outpaces any other drug that I've ever seen. There have been anecdotes uh, I remember a few years ago on the East Coast, there was a batch of heroin that came into the United States from probably Afghanistan or uh, certainly Southeast Asia. Everything feels like five years ago to me now, maybe it was six or seven years ago, but at any rate, there were a few dozen, maybe 35, 40 deaths in one weekend, and I think Providence, Rhode Island, because of that batch. And so you have anecdotal situations where there's one bad batch of drugs. This isn't a batch issue. This isn't an anecdote on a weekend. This isn't something that is going to pass. Uh, fentanyl is a cheap drug. It is a cheap substitute for other types of drugs. They have used it for years to cut into, or, or, or uh, think of it this way. Uh, in bars for, for, you know, since time immemorial, you may get a watered down drink. That's a way to make the booze go a little longer, increase the margins for the bar owner, et cetera. This is the same functional equivalent. They're adding, they add fentanyl just a little bit, makes the high better, uh, allows them to pull, hold back on the drug they're actually selling and maybe sell more of it. And if you are a seasoned addict who is used to using meth or heroin or cocaine and you have a tolerance built up, then you can probably absorb that and, and handle it. But if you are a kid or if you are somebody who is, is dabbling in this arena and you're not used to it. Um, it is not just bad, it is fatal. And I have not just anecdotes, but I have example after example. As I'm walking out today, they, one of my deputies popped his head and said, we're working on a warrant. I, won't, I, won't, I'll, you know, it's, I don't know enough about it, so I'm gonna be cryptic about what I say. But in one of our high schools in Sedgwick County, a kid, they walked out and found him passed out in his car. It was in drive um, this morning, one of our suburban high schools, and they had to Narcan him to bring him back. Narcan is the drug they administer to save someone's life when, they're in over, when they are in overdose. Without the Narcan, that child would have, it sounds to me like, would have died. We are now working that case, getting into his phone and things, trying to figure out who sold it to him, figure out where this comes from, et cetera. But we're, we're on the back side of that. We're, we're playing, we're, we're mopping up in that moment, okay? So let's talk, so, so why am I here? Just to, you know, give you more gloom and doom about what's going on with meth and drugs and, you know. No, this is, this is bigger than that. Um, most of the time when I come here, I give you, here's the state of the union. Here's what's going on in the criminal justice system. Uh, next time you run into one of your county commissioners, let them know you support what we do. It, that's the pitch, right? And frankly, I think it's an informed citizenry is always important. You should know. You care enough to come here, you should learn something, you should know about what's going on. This is different. This is me telling you something that I hope every one of you goes home and tells your parishioners, tells your grandchildren, your kids, your neighbor kids, your friends, so they can tell their neighbor kids. 
Yeah, I was on the news yesterday. We just had a thing, and I'll talk about it here today. The sheriff is, to his credit, while he's not only trying to run a, an office and run a jail, is taking the lead on from the law enforcement perspective and trying to get this message out. We did a press conference yesterday at the Phoenix. We'll talk about that here in a moment. But <clears throat> so you may have seen last night if you go back and Google, you know, K KSN, KWCH, etc., because they were all there. Apparently, I was in the news. I didn't see this, but there was a quote that I gave, and also I'll give it to you again. You know, kids are going to um, experiment. Uh, I grew up in an era when it was just say no. Nancy Reagan, God love her, said just say no. It was well intended. I don't think it was all that effective. Um, abstinence is probably has its place, but explaining abstinence of anything, sex, drugs, booze, whatever, to a 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 year old um, has never been, never proven universally effective. It does wreck it resonate with some kids, absolutely, and some kids hold to that. But there are a bunch who don't. And they're not bad kids. They just experiment. Uh, but my point yesterday was a Bud Light is not going to kill you. A little blue pill that your friend hands you at the party and says, this will get you, you'll, you'll, this is a great high, could. Small enough that you couldn't see it if I was holding it in my hand. So this isn't just me telling you how things are going. This is me giving you, arming you with information so that you can go back and not be hyperbolic and not say your grandma will be so disappointed if you use drugs. Because, okay, this is, look, you're going to do things. I get it. I'm not here to talk about abstinence. I'm not here to talk about never take a drink or, you know, God will judge you. You may feel that way, and that's a conversation for another day. This is don't take pills that come from places, unless you got it from a pharmacy. And if your friend says, well, I got it from my grandma's you know, medicine cabinet. I don't care. Uh, I'll give you a little tangent. This isn't real world for me. I have three daughters. I was a sex crimes prosecutor for 17 years before I became the district attorney. My girls know two things when they, I got two in college now. And, what, and I heard this in a roundabout way. One of them told this to a friend who told their dad who came back and said, man, you, you, you ingrained it in your kids. My girls know two rules. Never I don't care. You go to a party, never take a drink that you did not drink, bring yourself and open up yourself if you are a girl. And if that sounds sexist, I am unapologetic about it. Do not take a drink from somebody. Number two, if a girl passes out because she's had too many, you do not put her in a back room by herself. Let her sleep it off here in front of God and everybody in the living room because no one will hurt her there with her all standing around. I have been unapologetic about those two things. I'm not saying don't drink, don't, they're going to do what they're going to do. I can face reality or I can, you know, think I'm living in a bubble and my girls would never do that. Here's what I'm telling you. The message is when you tell your grandkids, your kids, your neighbor kids, whatever, the time you have the conversation about abstinence and tell them why they shouldn't do it and why their life will be better, all of which is true. But the main message is do not put something in your mouth, into your body, if you, that comes in a pill form. If you, if you didn't get it from the pharmacist who handed it to you, you opened it and took it because your doctor prescribed it. It, it could very well kill you. So if I sound heavy handed, again, unapologetic. All right. So let's talk about some statistics in Sedgwick County. I don't use national statistics and these are Jeff's Easter's. Um, so yeah, you can, the number, you can, I hope everybody can see this. It's, it's a little small, but let me, I will stay in front of the camera here. But so 2018, 2019, 2020, and 2021, and then this is through June of this year. This, this PowerPoint was put together at the end of June. So this is about six weeks old. But those will give you an assessment of the overdose deaths in Kansas. So Sedgwick County is the middle tier, the orange if you can tell the dis distinction between orange and red red is the rest of the counties we had and i'll just read them here 98 overdose deaths in 2018 115 sedgwick county 162 in 2020 242 in 2021 and as of june it looks like there's only three but that if that looks like a huge drop off give it a, don't be don't be lulled into to thinking that's a good sign toxicology takes six eight months sometimes so um, those are just the three that got found, tox came back, and we already knew by June. The numbers just balloon up toward the end of the year because it takes that long for the toxicology to come back on these, on these uh, autopsies. So <clears throat> the numbers to pay attention to are in just four years, from 2018 to 2021, 
again, full, four full years, we went from 98 to 242. Um, that's, that's, that should be troubling to anybody. <clears throat> Second slide, these are overdose count fentanyl related uh, versus other drugs. Again, if you can see this here, I'll stay close to the camera, but top one is other drugs. Second line, then second column uh, across is fentanyl related, and then the total. Fentanyl is orange, other related drugs are red. And you can tell in 2018, red far outpaced orange. Other drugs were the most common cause of overdose related deaths. And then the red is getting smaller by comparison. The orange is just exploding across fentanyl. So again, fentanyl related deaths in 2018 is 23 out of the 128. Uh, 28 in 2019, so not a huge increase, but from 2019 to 2020, we go from 28 to 90, and from 2020 to 2021, from 90 to 159. We're going in the wrong direction when it comes to fentanyl. Why? N number one, it's, prevail it's prevalence, there's more of it, and number two, it's lethality. It is so, it doesn't take much. Um, Google when you get home. Uh, cops, um, suffering from fentanyl, you look up something like that, or cops uh, who, who uh, react to fentanyl. Police officers go out and they're, you know, they pull a guy over for DUI, they get him out of the car and they look down and he's got a bag full of pills. They pull him out and they're gonna see, is this something you are supposed to have or not? They pick it up, they touch it, and cops are uh, getting in trouble. Now, it's not just absorbing through the fingers, but, but there, are, there have been situations where cops have gone into cardiac arrest and, they, and his backup shows up and has to give the cops Narcan. It's gone on around the country. Uh, you know, again, it's fairly anecdotal in, because normally you have to ingest it. It's not just gonna come in through the skin and that kind of a de minimis uh, touching. But cops are now, when they deal with pills and they deal with these things, they're putting gloves on because they don't wanna, I mean, they wanna go home at night. I mean, uh, it's one thing to get shot at and the, and the officers know when they sign up that they may be, get involved in life and death situations. Absolutely, it's part of the job. But they don't expect to die just handling somebody's you know, baggie of pills. So, um, bad stuff. And again, I'll thank the sheriff for putting these things together. Uh, very telling uh, PowerPoint here. <clears throat> Drug ID fentanyl positive um, test, you're gonna see, again, what he's trying to do here is just go from the months. So positive results on, on testing things. We're going from, <clears throat> these are cases I believe, if I understand his, his slide correctly, these are cases that have been made by the law enforcement. So three fentanyl positives, and we know from the overdoses there's more of them, but in terms of being on people's persons when they arrest them, three uh, to 24, to 107 to 190 in 2021. And already in June of this year, we were at 96. So on a pace to at least hit 180, 200. So we're, we're gonna beat last year as well. And you can kind of see the uptick in terms of even months. I, you know, there's not really a cyclical thing. It's just, I think the only cycle that's coming in that in terms of when it's available, in terms of times of year, whatever, it's as quick as, quick as the shipment can get here from, from across the border. Um, and that's the other thing too, in terms of what can we do, um, I, I've made my point about talking to your kids, talking to your neighbor's kids, talking to your neighbors, and you know, so there's that. But what can we do writ large in, the, in society? What can, what can the, the government do? What can the um, law enforcement do? Well, the, the reality is whether it's meth or fentanyl or you know, anything else, it's a matter of flow, you know, demand and, and access. I don't know of any, maybe I'm naive, but I don't know of any labs in Wichita or in Kansas or frankly in the middle part of the country, uh, I've not heard of any nationally, that are making fentanyl illegally in big laboratories and putting it on the streets. Um, it, it, that's, that's not how it's done. Methamphetamine, they, they cooked it for a long time around here. In the early 2000s, we had a ton of meth labs in Kansas, the state legislature in Arkansas first, I believe, or Oklahoma, one, one was first and then the second, but Oklahoma and Arkansas, and then later Kansas followed suit and put uh, Sudafed behind the counter. Uh, it's inconvenient for those of us who have seasonal allergies because I like that stuff from time to time because it dries you out and you can breathe, but it's a small price to pay to get rid of those meth labs because these guys are not chemists, they're drug addicts. They know how to follow, it's like me in the kitchen. I can follow a recipe, but if, if the, 
Wesson oil is not there or whatever. I don't know how to substitute. I don't know. I have to go ask you know somebody who knows what they're doing. If you take Sudafed out, they can't. There's no there's no workaround for them. So the labs dried up. But the cartels are nothing if not in in uh, motivated. And when all the marijuana became legal or or less criminal in the United States and people started being able to grow it here, the cartels' ability to sell us Americans marijuana began to dry up. So they can either fold up shop and go, well, that was fun while it lasted. I guess we'll have to go back to doing something else. Not going to happen. They thought, we're industrious. We'll come up with something else. And they started cooking methamphetamine. And now they're getting uh, a fentanyl. I don't pretend to know, and Jeff would be better to speak to this. I don't know if they're making it themselves or getting shipments from elsewhere. But the, the black market criminal uh, uh, enterprise is the one bringing this stuff into our country. So back to the, my question a moment ago, what can we do? The government needs to work on border security. And I don't mean that in terms, I know that's a loaded term. <clears throat> and there's a conversation to be had about illegal immigration. Fine, that's, that's a political point of view, and that's a conversation to be held in, in Congress, and elected officials need to have that conversation. Fair enough. I'm talking about not a political point of view, I'm talking about a public safety issue. And that is when we don't have secure borders, then the drug runners can bring meth and fentanyl and other drugs into our country and uh, expose our citizens to this stuff. We're not, it's not being made in Mulvane, okay? Um, it's not something that some guy's cooking up in his garage in Derby. Uh, it is coming in from outside the country and, and we need to do something about that. And a sheriff and a district attorney can, you know, do our, our level best to arrest people once they're caught. But I, I don't have any DAs down in, you know, Port Aransas. Uh, the sheriff doesn't have a, uh, an ability to stand at the Oklahoma line and, you know, run drug dogs over every set of cars that comes in. Um, this is, has to be a, a, a national effort. Um, so there's that. A couple other things, overdose st statistics, I think seeing it in different ways may help. Um, is there a, uh, again, we've got the, in the top left corner, it's percentage of decedents, the people who died, uh, we're breaking them down by different groups so you can kind of get a sense of, of who is being affected by this. Outside of the county is blue, so that's the smallest. Orange in that, again, top left is Sedgwick County. Over to the side here, to the top right, we've got it by age group. So, yeah, I'll just try to give you this a little hard to see here. Zero to 18 years of age is the pink, hot pink, 5.3. Zero to 18, 5.3. Uh, the largest is the orange, 29%, and that's gonna be your 19 to 29 year olds. I think that nobody's really surprised. That's the age when kids are experimenting and doing things. Uh, but, but just underneath that's 26.49, and that's the 30 to 39 year olds. And you think you're, you know, maybe getting out of that by, by that point, but it's still affecting them. That's the next biggest group. Uh, then the, the other color of hot pink here is 40 to 49 year olds, 19.987. 40 to 49, we're still dying of this stuff. Uh, purple is the 50 to 59 year olds, that's 13%. 13%, 50 to 59? And then the smallest group here are gonna be the 60 to 69 year olds, that's uh, less than 1%. And uh, I'm sure I can see the 70 to 79 year olds, you're pretty much out of the woods. I think most of you are not probably <laughs> doing too much. So, um, no particular order here. Next one down, we'll go back to this side again. Percentage of, by sex, so we got 27% female, 72% uh, male, again, you know, I always tell my girls, among the other things I beat into their heads is, boys at your age are, and my little one is stupid. I go, yes, that's it. You're listening. You know, the average young guy is just, yeah, so. Um, back over here, my race, breaking it down by race, we've got the biggest here, 72% white. Uh, 8.6% Hispanic, uh, less than 1% Asian, and 17% African American. So, 
affects everybody. I think to me, of all those, I mean, you're free to reach your own conclusions from what you just saw, but the one that jumps out at me the most that I guess is the most head scratching is the age breakdown. Just the fact that there's really not, I mean, from the time you're 18 to you're apparently 59, you're in that category of, of people who are you know, doing this stuff. Um, so the awareness campaign that we kicked off yesterday, or actually it's been kicked off before, this is the, 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 the push uh, to the community. One pill can kill. That's the, that's, that's the argument. It just, it's snappy, it, it's, rem, it's memorable, um, but that's the message. Again, it's not abstinence and don't do drugs, it's bad for you, It'll make, your life will be worse. These are amorphous ideas. These are, these are almost philosophical to people. They can disagree with this. One pill can kill. Is, is, that's just unequivocal. It's, it's there. You've got you to wrestle with that. Um, and this is a flyer that's gone out. And to their credit, the, the county um, has gotten behind this. And got another deal here. This is Division of Safety and, and uh, Environmental Services. I think it's part of the school system. They're putting out things for parents and talking points. And the point is there, there's information out there. It's not just you talking. Hey, I, t I heard this DA guy today, and he said this stuff. And it's, you really got to listen to him. It's very convenient. OK, tell me more about it. Well, I don't know more about it. Well, there are resources. And so there's, there's just places you can refer people to to get more information. To that end, we've also, again, the sheriff has pushed this big time. He's worked with the, the, the um, uh, media, with Wichita School District 259, with uh, Crime Commission and others, and um, launched this, this effort. Also here at Sedgwick County, if you can see it, sedgwickcounty.org backslash drug misuse. If you don't remember all that, Google Sedgwick County drug misuse and it should take you to this. Or just get on the county's website and you ought to be able to maneuver to it. But this is where a lot of this information is available. The county, again, to their credit, has recognized the issue and they're putting this out here so that there's talking points and places for people to go to get information to share it with others. The press conference yesterday was attended by, um, I think, every chief in the community. Uh, by that I mean, so Lem Moore, WPD, Sheriff, of course, but the chief of uh, all the other smaller jurisdictions, Goddard, Cheney, uh, Derby had a represent representative there, uh, Mount Hope, Park City, and we all lined up behind the sheriff to just to sort of as a show of solidarity that there is no community that is um, uh, immune from this. Uh, my kids go to, so most of you know I live way west, my kids go to Cheney schools, and there was a little girl who was a uh, good athlete. Um, in my daughter's class, my daughter's now a freshman in college, and often spoke to her last night. And her biggest complaint was she's calling me asking, "Can she wash a new purple shirt uh, with her with whites?" Uh, <laughs> and I'm like, "Let me make sure and ask your mother, and uh, I'll make sure I got this right." I think so, but <clears throat> you know, cold. I think um, that's her that's her concern right now, right? That's what a 19 year old kid should be worried about is these these learning steps to make sure she's you know becoming an adult. This little gal that was in her class uh, had, um, uh, you know, different circumstances. And there was violence in the home, there was drugs in the home, et cetera, and then she was gone one day. And I asked her, you know, well, I paid close attention to all the kids in the school, but I said, yeah, that, that, what happened to that girl? She was really fast. What, you know, she's not running track anymore? She goes, no, she's gone. She took off. To her, they left town. I'm like, oh, that's too bad. And then I heard last year. She was 18, um, living somewhere else in Sedgwick County, and she died, overdose. And it's just, I mean, this is a kid who went to school with my kids. Yeah, so um, anyway, not anyway. It's terrible. But that's one of the things that we did yesterday. And Jeff and the folks in the Crime Commission and Sharon over there at the Crime Commission, they got a family to come up. And that was the most powerful thing. You listen to a bunch of cops and elected officials, and they're saying this and baiting it in the ground. It's easy to tune it out. Don't listen to me. Listen to the mom and dad who stood up there and spoke. The mother talked about her 19-year-old son, Keith. Um, forever 19 is the poster that she put up there. Her son will be forever 19 because he was in his basement. He had a room, and he was an aspiring, budding musician, liked to record music. 
it was very loud, and so she knew not to bug him because it, it would interfere, uh, interfere with his recording. Uh, and then she got a feeling that something wasn't right. She went down and checked on him, and he was already gone. He had taken a pill. This is a Sedgwick County family. And this mother stood up in front of the cameras in that crowd and told, her, told their story. Um, it's devastating to listen to things like this. So um, that was very powerful. And I, and I really do hope I was impressed by the, the response in terms of volume of people there, the fact that all the media was present and the message is delivered. But it's easy, it's, you know, then next week some crazy thing will happen in D.C. or somewhere else and there'll be, a, somebody, there'll be a shooting, there'll be something, and we're going to lose focus. And then, you know, but we've got to keep this on the front burner. We've really got to get the message out. And not to compare the two, but I do press conferences and, and press releases on, on the regular about scams. The only way I can get, sometimes the only way we can get people's money back is to just don't lose it in the first place. When you get scammed and someone... Um, you know, takes your money online or, or by phone or something, uh, we'll move heaven and earth. And every once in a while, we had a great success story last year. A woman was a victim of a romance scam, and, and we managed to find like $500,000 of her money and get it back to her. It was astonishing. I couldn't believe I told my investigator, I don't, you, as far as I'm concerned, you wear a pointy hat and wave a magic wand. I was wildly impressed. She goes, well, yeah, but we didn't get the other four hundred grand back. I'm like, oh, geez. So we send these messages out. We send press conferences. Try to get people to know about scams, right? We still get victims every week. You know, I don't know how to get the message out anymore and walk up and down the street banging a drum saying, don't get scammed. Please don't send your money. Don't give your credit card information away. I kind of feel the same way here. You know, I'll say this today, going back to the office and, well, I got that done. No. I mean, we have to get this message out and continue to beat that drum weekly so that people can tell their kids you know I just how devastating to have your kid die I mean no, there's no reason no 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 way that wouldn't be devastating but just over something as silly as just taking a pill so um, reaching young adults one of the things I thought this was you know for a bunch of old cops and law enforcement officials you want to reach a t teenager? Find a social media influencer. If you don't know what that is, that's somebody who basically spends all day long posting inane crap on the internet. Um, <laughs> but people listen to them. And they influence. They call them influencers for a reason. And, the, and frankly, the private sector's figured this out. And marketing has figured this out. And so if you want to sell your product, you get a, a a social media influencer who has six or seven million followers to go, I like Pepsi, you know, whatever, and suddenly you'll see a little uptick in your, in your sales. Well, the sheriff and others thought, how do we reach teenagers? The sheriff having a video? Don't, you know, <laughs> really? They're going to go right through that. Get a social media influencer to go, dude, you got to stop. Can't do this. This will kill you. Tell your friends, you know. That's effective, and that's what they've done. So to their credit, they have really thought expansively about this, about ways to try to get this message across. It's not about enforcement and trying to, otherwise, we'll lock you up. No, that's I mean, fine. What am I going to do to these kids? Lock them up for a pill? No. That's, this is not about criminalizing the, the possessors. I mean, find me the guy who brings a 1,000 of them into town. I'll be, put them under the prison. But, but that's not the point of this conversation or this message. Um, sustaining fentanyl awareness, they're working on donations and, and fund to, to fund the ongoing efforts that I just discussed. Working with area partners, the schools, you know, these social media folks, billboards, the, the um, I think it's the WADA, uh, which are deal, car dealers association there. Most of those guys all have billboards and on their, over their uh, uh, new car lots. They'll, they'll flash signs and stuff so they can catch, because most of them are on Kellogg, and it's where all the, all the traffic is. So they're cooperative. You know, this is good corporate citizenry who are helping us out, get this message out. Um, WPD, DEA on town hall meetings, things like that. And frankly, looking for any other ideas that people might have. You know, they're, they're more brains, more uh, people focused on these issues that come together, uh, more success we're going to have in terms of getting the, the message out. Um, a couple other things I'll just say, you know, <clears throat> prosecuting users 
It's not a, uh, people in possession of a pill or two is not a particularly effective use of limited resources. I mean, we've got judges, we've got at least one judge in the courtroom or in the room here today that I'll tell you, we're backed up. We're doing everything we can. You know, on one other, another huge issue we have here is in this community and every other major city in America right now is gun violence. Um, we had 17 murders in 2013, my first year in office. Uh, we had 54 in 2020 and, and 52, I believe, last year. Have about 125 cases pending right now, homicides. But when I looked last month, we had 127 cases pending. But we also, or 125, we had 100, we had 27 in judgment. In lawyer lingo, what that means is we had 122, 123, 24 pending, ready for trial. But we had 27 that had been pled or tried, waiting sentencing. So, and that's, it takes about six weeks to get somebody from judgment or from trial to sentencing to get their P PSIs and everything together. What that tells you is we are trying about 25 murders a month or resolving about that many a month. I mean, we are at a breakneck pace. Um, and, but we're still, there's just so much gun violence. We just had our first, the, the state of Kansas a few years ago passed a RICO uh, racketeering organized crime state statute a few years ago to address gun violence and gangs and people who, who do that kind of work. Um, we filed the first one in Sedgwick County history last year, a year and a half ago, and last week tried seven of the eight guys pled guilty and agreed to do more time. We tacked on more time to their federal cases, et cetera, but one guy wouldn't do it, so we tried it. Tried the very first one in the state of Kansas, and the jury came back in under an hour, guilty. Um, so it's another way to attack. And these, this was a crew that had put, I think, six or 700 shell casings on the ground in Sedgwick County in the previous six months. Um, we're trying to, put, to go after these guys, target these guys. That's where we're spending our resources. Going after a kid with a pill in his pocket is just not, gonna, is not the effective way to attack this issue. Um, that's not to say I'm looking, turning a blind eye, but I'm trying to turn an, an effective eye to this issue. Um, <clears throat> right now, or no, excuse me, not right now, so today's Friday, Tuesday, I was presented a case. We're waiting on one final report to come in, but the case that was pre presented to me was a 22-month-old uh, who picked up a pill with fentanyl in it and swallowed it, deceased, killed the kid, 22 months old. Uh, we have a pending case right now involving a 15-year-old victim. She was a runaway, ended up in a uh, motel. Let's see, where am I? Right there, I can see it from here. Where we're sitting, if you walk to that window, I could show you where this 15-year-old girl went into this hotel, I've got video of it. She walked into the hotel, she never walked out, died. Sexual assault, assault probably, yeah, sexual assault, and uh, died of an overdose from the pills that were in the room. Uh, this morning I said, the, the, the situation at the high school here in Sedgwick County. I just added that right before I walked in here, well, type it up. Um, also, drugs, you know, just as a general matter, one of our biggest drivers of drug of crime is just drugs. Um, you know, I'll, I'll go off on one tangent here, and that is when it comes to legalization of marijuana, there's this notion that it, you know, we, we just fill the prisons full of people with a joint in their pocket. Well, number one, that's not true. Um, the last year we had statistics from the state that I'm aware of was 2019, 2020. We're, COVID kind of threw off all the, the ability to get reliable statistics. But the last time we had a normal year in 2019, there were six people who went to prison in the state of Kansas across 105 counties for possession of marijuana. And I can tell you how that happened. They either had incredible criminal history or they violated their probation over and over and over again. Our prisons are not full of kids or people with a joint in their pocket, okay? Um, now, whether there's a, a role for there to be a legalization of marijuana or not is a public policy question for our state legislature. I have personal opinions, but frankly, they're irrelevant. I, I follow the law. I, if I want to make the law, I'll go run for Steve Owen's seat. Um, <laughs> Heston's nice. I make a move up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or Leo's seat. I, actually, I, I know Leo's neighbor. I'll move into Leo's house, and I'll run against Leo. But, <clears throat> but the, you know, the, the question, though, is if we're going to do these sorts of things, what are... If anyone wants to do it, my, my first question when they say, what's your position on legalization of marijuana? My answer is, what's your position on making it viable? Meaning, if you just legalize it, you because this, this naive Pollyanna notion that all problems will go away is ridiculous. Look at California. It's a, or not California, Colorado. It's turned into a mess. Not because they legalized marijuana, but because they didn't do anything to establish an infrastructure first. 
I'm not advocating for it, but I'm saying if you're going to have the conversation, have an honest conversation because the black market has exploded in these places. Um, you know, so it's, just, it's not just a matter of drugs being legal or illegal. It's when the drugs are being <clears throat> booze. We tried to do it with booze years ago with prohibition, but now it's regulated. I, have, has anyone ever bought a six pack of beer from a black market bootlegger? <laughs> you know, um, no, you go to a liquor store because it's regulated and that's where you get it. The problem is marijuana can be grown. I mean, it, it's, it's easier to come from multiple sources. So trying to set up an infrastructure for it becomes that much more difficult. But what I'm getting at is, as a result of all those things, drugs, where, the, where drugs are at, drugs are sold. And when drugs are sold, there's a guy on the other side with a gun because he knows if I rob you, you ain't going to call the cops. Hey, I was selling marijuana and I got, I got robbed. The cops are going to go, come with us. Say that again on camera. <clears throat> um, so drugs, fentanyl, meth, marijuana, etc., the sale, the hand-to-hand -hand sales that go on every day, probably happened a few times since I've started talking somewhere in this, in this town, um, lead to someone walking in and going, you know what, I got a better idea. Why don't you hand over all your cash? And those, drug, those, those crimes, those drug rips, they call them, uh, lead to violence. People get shot all the time, and that's another huge driver of crime. So, you know, drugs are just, take drugs off the, off the face of the earth, now, probably by next Tuesday, they'd figure something else out. But at least for the weekend, we'd have a very quiet weekend. <laughs> um, last couple things, I'll just reiterate. It's not exactly as if I've hidden my lead or buried the lead here. Uh, parents, talk to kids. Talk to them candidly. I, I'm not here to tell you how to parent your kids, but I am here to say that telling them that you know, all drugs are evil and that you're a bad person if you do it and grandma's going to judge you. If you have that kind of relationship and your kid will respond to it, go with it. But the reality is when it comes to fentanyl, and that's really why I'm here, um, a kid who smokes a joint is going to survive it. They're going to get on with their life, and hopefully they realize it was you know, not something they want to repeat the rest of their life. Kids are going to experiment with booze. They're going to hopefully figure out how they can handle it, or they figure out that they can't and they quit. Um, there is a you know, billions of dollars industry in terms of uh, addiction specialists trying to get people off of drugs and alcohol. So uh, I'm not here to be the proponent of drugs and alcohol. But I'm here to say that that's a conversation to have and, and wrestle with. Fentanyl is different. It's just, it just is. And fentanyl is, do not, you can't mess with it. If you take something that has that stuff in it, you, you don't wake up. Um, and what an absolute tragedy, what a damned tragedy for a family to deal with because a kid took what is really a benign and innocent mistake um, and cost them their life. Um, I said track cell phone activity. It's just always a good idea when it comes to your kids. I, this morning, right now, I can tell you where my 23-year-old, my 19-year-old, my 15-year-old are right now on a device on my phone. I don't, I'm not a helicopter parent. You know, I'm not going to jump them, but I, I, it's, a, it's a safety issue. I want to know where they are. And if I can't reach one of them, I want to know where the hell they were the last time I could reach them. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, again, I don't apologize for that, and, I, and none of us should either when it comes to having candid conversations with kids and family members and friends, because if it saves a kid's life, you know, uh, it's, it, it, it's, it, and if it, because if the alternative is just too, too dire and too heartbreaking to even consider. So, well, thank you for your time. I'll answer any questions you might have, but that's the message. <laughs> Thought I saw a hand in the back. Not so much. Okay. Oh, here we are. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for being here. Uh, Sir. Very important issue. Uh, in your statistics, do you have it broken out into uh, suicides, uh, suicide attempts with fentanyl? I have, I have a circumstance where I know sure they tried to acquire it and it in vain and they weren't able to reach it. And isn't somebody that supplies, aren't they liable for murder? Oh, yeah. So, I'm sorry, I, I wasn't very clear earlier. I'll go in reverse order. The one where I'm saying right there, I can literally, as I'm standing here, see the hotel where the girl died. That's a murder case right now and also a sexual assault case. So when we can prove who provided the lethal dose, we do have that ability. It is very difficult to prove because I get in someone's phone and so that yesterday at 3 p.m., you know, Joe Smith bought from Bob Jones the, the, meth, the, meth, the fentanyl that, killed, that we think killed him. Prove to me beyond a reasonable doubt that he didn't get somebody else's between 3 p.m. and 9 a.m. this morning. 
I mean, it's very difficult to do. With that one, she went into a hotel room and she never came out. I got video of it. That's easier for me to prove. But absent that, yeah, in theory we can, but the ability to truly do that is, is very difficult. Your first question had to do with suicide. The statistics do not break out how many were suicide-related fentanyl deaths as opposed to just fentanyl death. It's just a, a, a just trying to identify the number of people who died based on fentanyl. Part of the issue there is it's hard to know what was suicide and what was just a, an accidental situation unless there's left a note or something. But um, I'm not aware of any effort to have broken that down specifically. But you're right. It's an, it, it can also be used intentionally to take a life. But I'm, I'm trying to focus at least big picture on the ones who do it unintentionally. Yes, sir. Or another name yet? Sir. Attorney Dan. Drugs. Fentanyl met long before that. We got a long history of it in this country, all over the world. Who's looking the other way? <laughs> There's politicians and government officials. Someone's got to be paid off. This is just too big and it's too easy to keep going. You know, it, <clears throat> I always look for the, you know, never attribute to malice that which can be easily explained by stupidity, right? Um, do I think there's somebody in high levels of government who's turning a blind eye because their pockets are getting lined? I, it's possible, I suppose. But the reality is it's, it's, it's probably a simpler explanation than that, and that is we have a long border, uh, and we have ocean ports, and we have people who are motivated. I mean, part of our issue, and we take I mean, I'm not here to preach, but one of the things, I'll, I'll echo what you said. We have a long history of drug problems in this country. Um, one of the things we have to address, if we're going to be honest, is as a country, what the hell's wrong with us? I mean, we have so many people who use so many drugs. The reason they bring it up here is because we will buy it, you know. Um, but the point is there's, where there's supply, there's demand. And, or demand, there's supply, excuse me. And the demand's here. And so these folks are going to find a way through across the border, through the ports, any other way. And so I think part of it's just, if I were working in Homeland Security, it's an overwhelming task. You have an almost an innumerable number of folks trying to bring drugs in here because there's that many people ready to buy it and you know I, I don't I wouldn't want that job I hope we don't ever underestimate the burden that you carry every day on our behalf thank you I can't even fathom That's it. I will say I went to the chiropractor for the first time this morning and I walked in he goes are you hurt and I go he goes injury and I go insane career choice <laughs> Uh, conference some time ago, I think maybe you might have been at that same one, they were, there was concern then about fentanyl sneaking its way into pharmacies. Has that happened? Is there any concern there? I have not heard of that happening in pharmacies. I have heard of it though, people will get stuff on the street and it looks like and is labeled as uh, it would look the same as if you walked into a pharmacy and, and, and it's the same deal. Anybody who takes a prescription strength pill of any kind, near, I think all of them have some stamp on them so that you know, and the pharmacist knows that what they're giving you is the thing you've been prescribed. So you can look at it and go, that's a Percocet, that's a Oxycontin, right? On the street, we are finding now pills that have been stamped to look just like, they're counterfeits. And so you go, okay, that, that's, I know what that is, that's an Oxy. I take grandma's oxy, I ran through all of that. Now I need some more, I can't get any more, so I'll buy it from you. Hey, this is Oxycontin. Yes, it is, and I take it. No, it's not. So I've not heard it in the pharmacies, I've heard it in the street. The black market is showing what looks to be pharmacy grade pills are not in fact, and they're full of, they're full of fentanyl. Does that answer your question? Okay. So I'm a third physician. You know, I agree with what you said, but uh, you know, there's a need for fentanyl uh, for medical reasons. Uh, there are many patients uh, with uh, cancer, and they have pain, they're suffering. So we have no choice uh, but to prescribe uh, fentanyl. Sure. Yeah, I'm, in terms of prescription, if I, would, I want to be clear about this, getting it from a pharmacy, knowing what you're getting, having it prescribed in a, in a healthy dose, that's not my absolute. That's between a physician and their patient. But it's, it's kids who are getting stuff off the street that are black market. They're not coming from a pharmacy. They're coming from across the border. Uh, it's not coming in a raw form either. I, maybe I wasn't clear about that. It's not as if fentanyl's coming in raw and then being assembled here. The pills are coming from over, over, or outside of the borders. 
Uh, and so, yeah, I, this is not a this is not a, a characterization or that that people who take pain meds are uh, uh, you know the problem. It's it's black market. Sure. Uh, yeah, you said you couldn't uh, charge uh, pushers with uh, the death penalty or unless you caught red-handed. <coughs> what type of penalty do you give them when they're caught with fentanyl? And do you, hopefully they get enough time that you never see them again in your career. Uh, so I brought yeah. my grandsons in here so they could hear from the horses. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Tell your friends. So if we can get them on, um, there's a couple of different charges. One is felony murder, the underlying felony being like a sale of the drugs, uh, and that's 25 to life. There's a bill that was passed, Steve, or I know he stepped out, but Leo may remember the, there was a bill that's passed, and I always forget, I can find it, but I can't remember the name. It's not, it doesn't just roll off the tongue, but it's basically sale of the narcotics that lead to a death. Um, that's a level one, I believe, and so that's going to be 159 to 645, depending on your months, excuse me. So 13 to 54 years, that's the range, depending on your criminal history. Uh, in terms of just the possession, and that doesn't lead to a death, uh, the, the possession's pretty de minimis. It's a, what's called a level five, and you're probably going to get probation just for having it. For selling it, it depends on the weight. How much do you sell? Sell three pills, you're not going to do much time. Sell a truckload of pills, you're going to do more time. So, um, but the other reality is we don't put people in prison for drug sales for decades. Uh, it's a bottom line is it's a it's a an issue that as a legislature they've had to wrestle with, and that is, do we build more prisons at a cost of twenty nine thousand dollars a year to put someone in prison? Um, we're going to reserve that for for people who pull triggers and rape people and things like that. But we at least carve out a, a thing that if you sold the drugs that killed somebody and I can prove it, yeah, you'll go to prison for decades. Yeah, Mr. Ben, I don't have any questions to the drug question. I have one question to race question about prostitutes in this country. We know with the racial situation in this country now, there's a lot of pressure on every institution to do things for reasons other than, you know, what's just and so forth in this case. I was asking particularly about the use of prosecutors in this country as what I call where racial lynchings are done by prosecutors in this case rather than private enterprise where the definition of lynching is where truth or justice is not the end goal of the system, but it's getting the result that certain demographics want so we don't have riots and burnings and so forth. I think the Derek Chauvin trial was a racial lynching, the Cal Rittenhouse trial was a racial lynching, and the worst one was the Aubrey trial, the, the running guy down in Georgia, where people have prosecuted these people and yet justice is always, we, we understand justice and truth is, is not an easy thing to get under the fifth of circumstances. Yes, my question is, <laughs> is uh, what do you do or what do you think prosecutors can do with the present racial climate to avoid being pressured to do things for reasons of racial pantry and so forth? Well, here's what I'll say, Gerald. I, I mean, I know your, your position on that. And I'm not going to comment in those particular cases. I wasn't, I mean, I can see what the media is showed I can tell you that when I look at my cases um, they don't have access the media doesn't have access to my files um, they sometimes report things accurately sometimes they don't so I'm not going to presume to know what went on in any particular case because I wasn't there and didn't have access to those files but to your larger point uh, how does a prosecutor avoid being influenced by outside th things what, whatever the source of that information may be or whatever the motives of the people who are trying to peddle that pressure here's my answer um, and I, I think good, anyone who's a public politician, anyone who runs for public office, who you look back at a career and, and feel like they did the right thing and they were someone you respected, I think there's one, one thread that runs through, Democrat or Republican, and that is they were more worried about doing their job than they were about getting reelected. And my feeling is, <laughs> I am a Republican, I don't make any, Apologies for that. I have been my whole life. I was raised by uh, people who voted for Alf Landon for president all the way, you know, all the way on. F fifth generation Kansan, I am. Um, but if you can tell what I am by the way I do my job, Democrat or Republican, I ain't doing my job. I've never tried to politicize this office. Um, if I'm running for Senate, if I'm running for House of Rep, absolutely. But for me and the sheriff, we are, I have a luxury that is not, not enjoyed by really anyone else other than a judge. 
And there's no other politician, no, no other person who runs for office who has the luxury that Easter and I have. It comes with pressure. But the luxury is I follow the law, and that's it. That's my only thing I ascribe to. And if there are outside influences, whether it's George Soros or anyone else, and they want to put somebody in who will say that uh, they want to juxtapose their position against mine, then they're going to have to juxtapose themselves against that. If you think you can do a better job, explain to me how being a Democrat or a right or wing Republican than me would make you better at my job. My job requires experience and a knowledge of the law, and after 27, 28 years of doing this, you may not like me, but anytime I issue an opinion or do something, I try to ground it in the law. Uh, and I know half the time, I'm gonna, if I, when I'm done with a press conference, if I haven't pissed off half the room, I probably haven't done my job. <laughs> You've heard about how addictive other drugs are. Can you speak to that, the fentanyl? It's. I'm not, again, I wish Jeff were here for, to talk to this because I think he deals more with the hand-to-hand -hand side. I'm seeing it after it's been filtered through a defense attorney and, and other things. I'm not aware of people who get addicted to fentanyl the way they do other things. It is an additive the way I see it. Uh, and if I'm wrong, there, and I don't, don't take me to the bank on this, but at least the perception I get by the time it filters up to me is that it's being used as an additive to cut to, to like I said, the analogy of water in a drink uh, in a, you know, in a, in a whiskey. Um, to, to, to increase profits, okay? Um, I don't know of people who are getting addicted and using it and needing more and more and more to get high, like say heroin. It's more that someone's using heroin and then they get, uh, uh, fentanyl gets added to it and that's what kills them because they weren't expecting it. So, and I want to clarify too, I've talked about pills, 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 because the most, my, my emphasis here obviously is about kids. There's not, I mean, yes, heroin's in, in this community, and there are people who will die of heroin overdoses or, or heroin used laced with fentanyl. We're not seeing teenagers in high schools shooting up heroin, okay? They're taking pills. That's what's causing these unintended deaths among kids. But that's not to negate the fact that it could be in coke powder, powder cocaine. It could be in crack cocaine. These, these drugs are less in vogue than they were 30 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, but methamphetamine could have it in it. But pills is, the, is my big concern when it comes to the younger population. But, you know, if you know somebody who's an addict, and my, somebody in this room does, unless you are this mo the most unique group of human beings ever assembled in Cedric County, all of us know somebody who's an addict of something. And they could, you could have, know an adult who is using methamphetamine who could lose their life to this stuff as well. I, I didn't want to lose that in the, in, the, in the delivery of my message here today. District Attorney, Mr. Mark Thank you, Mr. Uh -huh.